Good morning everyone and uh, welcome to another edition of Elevens Is. Uh, you're watching Kevin Williams here of Survival Skills Rider Training uh, on the topical news, controversial views and biking tips show. Uh, I've got a special for you this morning. We're following up part one of the interview that I ran with uh, suspension guru Dave Moss uh, last Monday when he talked about motorcycle uh, setup for the individual, basically how to adjust the bike to fit you rather than the development rider and we're going to carry on uh, on the theme but this morning we're going to be looking at suspension setup um, and I've run through a number of questions for Dave uh, basically to give everybody uh, whatever you ride whether you've got a bike with a top end suspension that's fully adjustable or whether you've got a sort of something with bum basic suspension to give you an idea of what you can do to get your motorcycle handling better uh, than uh, it comes out of the factory. Um, before I go into the interview, just a reminder that I am putting uh, content up online on my coffee page, uh, which will help you follow the content of my performance bends course. That's going up as we talk. There are also 100 articles up there for, from Facebook 
uh, which you can also access uh, as part of the uh, su subscriber and supporter content over there. So do go and have a look, um, see what you like over there. And if you like it enough, uh, you can become a supporter or a subscriber. Right. OK, with no further ado, let's switch to the interview and get that running. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second of our two interviews with Dave Moss, our setup and uh, suspension expert from California. How are you doing this morning, Dave? Splendid to yourself. Uh, yeah, not too bad. Uh, sitting here looking at the wonderful weather out the window, wishing I was out there on two wheels, but hey, -ho, we can't have it all. Um, you did mention last time out that you were actually able to, to ride if you rode um, social distancing. Have you yes. That? Um, as long as you're not in a group of five, if you're in a group of five, each person gets a thousand dollar ticket on the spot. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Painful. <laughs> <laughs> so people, uh, if you are riding with your friends, when you arrive, you disperse into groups of three and everything is well with the world. But uh, that is one of the more punitive consequences of aggregating in groups. So all for a good reason and a financial sting that makes people adhere to the social distancing rule, which is good for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. OK. So anyway, last time out, what we were talking about was um, the posture riding, uh, yeah. how the rider actually interfaces with the motorcycle and how we overcome some of the problems of a, a one-size-fits-all motorcycle. Um, you took us through some of the issues of, that affect riders with uh, not simply different stature, but also different weights and different shapes too. Um, so we also have to make um, allowances for the compromise with the suspension, don't we? Because again, what we are looking at whenever we buy a motorcycle is a bike that has a setting that was designed for one person and one person only. To that extent, yeah, there's, there's certainly, we never get the information on who the test rider was. We get absolutely zero information of who they are with their ability, weight and stature. Um, we also get zero information on who signed off on all of this being okay for mass production. So as a consequence, we get what we purchase. And then at that point, if there are adjustments there, then there may be some information in the manual. There may not. And to a large extent, you're left to your own devices. Um, so I try and provide people with inf basic information where they can get out a tape measure, a socket, a screwdriver, or a three millimeter or four millimeter Allen and get to work and actually begin to make that motorcycle work for them. Yeah, it does seem very odd that, um, you know, we, we are given these, uh, some bikes now have multiple adjustment points on the bike and yet there's very little uh, assistance to actually tune the machine to fit the rider. Um, ride height, rebound, compression, there's three expressions that most people probably have heard of and I would uh, I'd, I'd hazard a guess that a significant proportion of those people don't really understand what they are. So can you take us through them one at a time and explain what they actually refer to? Sure. So let's start with ride height. That can also be called sag, and it can also be called you're too light or you're too heavy. <laughs> so what that basically means is you have to fully extend the suspension, and we have a center stand or a side stand, which allows us to do that. And then we pick two points to measure from in the front and the rear. Once you've got those two data points and that me initial measurement, then you put the bike under its own weight. And then you measure again. Now, in the forks, there will be engineering that allow the forks to collapse partially. But in the rear shocks, sometimes there is not. So we have to figure out whether the back of the bike will collapse under its own weight or it doesn't collapse at all. And that can be extremely 
problematic, but we'll get into that later. Then you put the rider on and then you measure again using the same two points for the third measurement. And so when you add all that together, or if you're doing it in the reverse, you subtract everything. The goal is for the front and rear to be somewhere between 30 to 40 millimeters and somewhat even. Now, depending on the engineering and what we're given and your physical weight, you may find there is a massive imbalance where the front is too soft or the rear is incredibly too soft. It is very rare to find a motorcycle that is even when you sit on it, even a standard or a touring motorcycle. And this is true of finding that data point, whether you have electronic suspension or whether you have manually adjustable suspension, because the amount the bike wants should collapse. And a lot of people will ask about touring bikes. Well, at that point, the easy thing to do, with, no matter what your discipline is, 30 to 35 percent because road bikes have generally 100 to 120 millimeters of travel. Touring bikes may have up to 180 and dirt bikes may have 240. So running the percentage to start makes a little more sense as a universal starting point for most people across the board. But if we're talking about road bikes, not touring, so standards and sport bikes, you would start at somewhere between 30 to 40 millimeters because a flat bike will do anything you want. As soon as you go outside of those parameters, then the bike by default will behave in a unique way. Is the front softer? It'll turn quicker. Is the back softer? It'll run wide in the corner and it's harder to steer. So a simple assessment with a tape measure can really help you understand why your bike behaves the way it behaves from that perspective. And then you'll find out right away if you're, for example, 10 millimeters when you sit on the bike, that would explain why you are going down the road, constantly getting booted out of the seats and your hands are exhausted from holding on to the grips to keep you on the motorcycle. But conversely, if you're at 70 or 80 millimeters, then it's going to feel exactly the same way. And the consequence is your suspension is dramatically too soft. So the tape measure is the first tool to use specifically for ride height to assess what you've got when you sit on the bike. And then you have to do it again if you're going to carry a passenger. That is a huge responsibility that unfortunately too many of us don't want to do. But putting the person on the back of the motorcycle can devastate the way that it rides and introduce an enormous amount of risk and their life is in your hands. So using a tape measure to see where you're at, at least understand the consequence of putting the passenger on. And if you can't figure out what to do, then there's help on both YouTube and websites, but there's also help in your local shop. And I'm all about you supporting your local business if you don't have the knowledge and tools because if they're not really sure what to do, they'll figure it out and then they'll help hundreds of people after you. So the pay it forward aspect is wonderful in that regard. So <clears throat> that's the classroom piece because we're using a tape measure and getting data. So the next piece is the real world when we go right. Um, if you put a cable tie on the right fork leg, that will go to its lowest point and it will show you how much travel you use one of the danger parts here is that we don't mark where the forks mechanically bottom. Now, in some cases, that can be 40 millimeters of tube you can see, but you make the assumption you can use it. And a lot of crashes result from suspension being too soft and no bottom mark being marked. And the same is true of the rear shock. Nobody gets in there with Q-tips and cleaning polish to clean a rear shock in general. So the shock shaft will be clean with the amount of travel you use and it will be dirty with the amount of travel you don't. So you can then use your eyes, use a cable tie in the front to assess how much travel you're using, which gives you the next tier of knowledge because setting something up by the book doesn't mean given your knowledge, experience and skills, 
that it is adequate. So then we have to use our eyes and a cable tie to understand when we're writing how much of the suspension we do actually use. Okay, so that's uh, ride height covered. Um, what about uh, rebound and compression? Because that affects the way the uh, forks and the shocks work too, doesn't it? Yeah, so the easiest way to explain this is <clears throat> at home, whether you have a kitchen tap that is a dial or a lever, do you know where maximum flow is? I have never to, to date met anybody that knows exactly where that point is because it is pointless. But with motorcycles, we have taps and those taps control flow and the wider or the further out counterclockwise you go, the more flow you are allowing the oil to have, the more clockwise you go, the more you restrict it. So the part about compression, which follows on from the ride height piece, is there a team? The steel and structural support of the springs holds the bike up. And then the backup system to that spring is going to be your hydraulics, and in this case, compression damping. Now, not knowing where flow is on the kitchen tap is inappropriate with a motorcycle in terms of hydraulics. So you need to know where it works. So the best part for that is if you take it all the way clockwise and count the number of turns and clicks back, that gives you total range. If you put it at 50% on the forks and the shock, and that would include high speed damping in the shock if you have it, which is generally a nut that's 14, 15 or 17 millimeters. If you put everything in the middle and go ride, it's, you're going to feel how that rides. You can come back depending if you want to go towards maximum because your cable tie and your shock are using a lot of travel. Then you're going to go into 75% with clockwise at maximum being 100. How does it feel at 75%? Well, if the bumps get a lot bigger and it's uncomfortable, then bring it back slightly. But do it to all of the compression adjusters evenly. <clears throat> so the steel's holding the bike up for ride height. Compression damping is controlling movement of oil forwards and backwards. And that is basically bump absorption. Because to compress something, you then have to get a reaction and that reaction's rebound. So if you use compression correctly, the amount of travel you should use on average is 60 to 75%, which gives you, depending on the engineering you've got, a ride quality that you can adjust at will. Right, okay. So basically the, the, the spring is a mechanical device which uh, puts a, a sort of a, a, a bottom line on the ride height yep. and then the damping changes the rate at which that spring will compress and rebound as the suspension moves up and down over bumps. Correct. Yep. So you have two, two items there you can adjust. Um, you may find that what you did with the book and what you end up for yourself in the real world by riding are completely different. As we're not robots and we are unique humans, the way we ride is different for all of us. So when you're done, the part there is to record the settings for ride height and compression that you like, <clears throat> and most importantly, to record the age of the oil. You can do that with the odometer, or you can do it with a date either way <clears throat> because there's a part there that we'll get to after rebound about servicing that is missing in most owners handbooks and sometimes even in service manuals so to go on to rebound um, <clears throat> we grew up with lava lamps we know what those things are you would plug them in at three o'clock in the afternoon and by two in the morning they're moving <laughs> so Rebound itself is based on how much something compresses and pings back. So the easiest analogy for everybody to think through there is a trampoline. If you walk across it, you barely leave the bed of the trampoline. But if you drop in from 10 feet, there's that delightful moment of stillness 
before the eject button throws you up into the air. Otherwise known as potholes, manhole covers, railway lines, and various and other sundry uh, road conditions that we encounter that put a violent blow into the suspension. So rebound is hydraulic again, it's position of the tap to manage that release of energy. Now you can't set it to a worst case scenario because then the bike would just be doing this, waiting for that massive impact. So we've got to set it as a compromise. And that compromise is your riding environment. Generally, we ride the same type of roads. We ride in this commute to work or we stay in a city it's rare that we move outside of those um, so you need to set based on the amount of travel you use that rebound damping but you need to do that when the oil is hot because cold oil moves very slow compared to hot oil so rebound damping has to be set and the goal is to avoid this what we want is that straight up straight down because at that point the bike is perfectly balanced and we don't hit a bump and then have this or worse when we're leaning have that with your so rebound is something you should revisit about every thousand or fifteen hundred miles because the oil is aging and therefore its viscosity when hot is different so at that point you need a test ride day because when the bike's set up correctly you have this wonderful epiphany of how glorious the world is the clouds have parted the sun is beaming life is wonderful and then we get to our best and worst quality as a human which is adaption so if you continually adapt the handling will degrade slowly imperceptibly over time and you will get to the point where the bike hurts when you ride it and it generally hurts because rebound balance is off and you're fighting the bike all the time. And that's a word and phrase. We know what it means. A lot of your viewers will know what it means because back in the day, you couldn't control rebound damping. Now, if you don't have an adjuster, you can choose the correct oil viscosity. So it's still fixable. The question then becomes with your rear shock, and those are the problematic ones, if it's sealed, you can't service it. So you have to replace it or find somebody with engineering skills to make it serviceable. And unfortunately, <clears throat> one of the problems there is you need a specialist and craftsmanship is a dying thing these days because it's much more convenient to replace it. It's interesting what you just said about uh adaptability because it brings back to mind a a, a ride i did many years ago actually uh, down to the uh, paul ricard circuit in the south of france for the 24-hour race down there and uh, i was riding down there with a buddy and as you do we got part way down and swapped bikes and we both got off an hour or so later at the end of a, a lovely bit of twisty mountain road and we each said almost simultaneously how in god's name can you ride that pile of junk and we both pointed out what the flaws in each other's motorcycle was and both of us said well, it doesn't feel like that to me but you know when i looked at what looked back on that and thought about it objectively what i realized was of course that i'd been riding around these problems they've been developing slowly and i was riding around them and and he was doing exactly the same so yeah we we do adapt and we really don't notice what's going on Here's another story that will make you laugh as well. Another 24-hour race, actually. Trip this one to Spa in Belgium. I was um, I was down there, and at that point, I had a GSXR 750, so it had uh, pretty much fully adjustable suspension front and rear. And um, the word got, you know, people were talking about us, and not many other people had adjustable suspension at that time, so they were asking, does it really make any difference? So I sort of climbed under the bike and started twiddling all the twiddly bits and said, right, now you bounce up and down on that. And, of course, it had gone rock solid um, as I'd wound all the damping and compression up to the maximum. Um, anyway, that was 2 a.m. in the morning, of course, after several bits. <laughs> when I got back on the bike on the, uh, the Monday morning, some 24 hours later, I couldn't understand why the bike was handling like 
bank on roller skates. And in fact, I didn't actually remember this event till about uh, two, uh, two weeks later. And I'd been trying to figure out what on earth was wrong with motorcycle. And I had almost got to the point of ordering a new rear shock for it. Uh, I suddenly remembered what I'd been doing to it uh, late that night uh, under the influence of some alcohol. So the, um, the problem that I experienced at that point was, of course, I had no idea where the right. setting had been before I'd fiddle with it. So two questions in one. Um, how important is it to know where your base settings are? And then how do you keep track of what you're changing? Because there are so many things that you can change on a modern motorcycle that it's so easy to do exactly what I did, which is fiddle with everything. And then you've no idea what is actually happening. No, that's, that's a great story because a lot of people go through that. And the other part of that story and the unfortunate truth is too many people are fearful of actually doing anything, let alone checking that the settings they have match if they have them the settings that are in the owner's manual because they just don't want to touch it so um i think the first part there is if once you set sag then it's pretty easy to know where your settings are there's an industry rule to that but i don't think for what we're doing here that's appropriate because that industry rule generally applies to faster riders and track riders the, the part here is knowing where you're at is the number of turns clockwise to maximum or the number of turns counterclockwise from maximum. Whether that is makes sense to you, one way or the other, no matter what adjuster you touch, you do it the same way. Because at that point, every data point is done in an identical manner. So once you've done that, the part there is Go to the compression settings, find your range by starting at maximum clockwise and counting back and put it in the middle on all of them. Part is because rebound is a shifting target because of oil age and viscosity. If you do have rebound adjustment, then you need to find where it works. And so there's a video where I'm pushing on a bike. <clears throat> And there's a video where somebody is sat on a bike and somebody else pushes on it. And you can see their shoulders just bounce and settle out. So visually, it becomes very easy to see as a third party what is working and what is not. If you don't have that luxury, then it's very simple as a rider on the motorcycle on a ride. If you decelerate and you do it correctly, you should never leave the seat. And if you do leave the seat when you decelerate, then the shock is coming up too fast. So at that point, we have, because it's a tap, too much flow. So we need to restrict the flow by going clockwise. It may click, it may turn, but you recall what you did. So every time you decelerate, does the bike decelerate and load the front correctly and you stay perfectly still in the seat? then that's a pretty good setting. The next test you can do is a nice long sweeper with your hands on the bars. If you relax your left, but it cannot row or go side to side. So you may feel the bar push your hand rhythmically in a long, long corner with a steady or maintenance throttle. That will tell you the front end is pogoing. So at that point, you do the same thing. Do you have one rebound adjuster or do you have two? Do you have your rebound adjuster in one leg versus the other leg? Is all your damping in one leg? So you've got to read your onus manual and have a look to see which does what. Generally, it will say COM and 10, and 10 is tension or rebound, or it will say REB. So at that point, you go clockwise again in small increments until you sweep through the corner and the Bars don't move. That will give you balance. So an assessment, as you decelerate approaching the corner, if you pop up and leave the seat, then rebounds too fast. As you go through the corner, if you can relax your left hand, rebound is correct in the front forks. And if you were to do the push test, the bike does this and settles right out at the top of the stroke. 
as oil ages, revisiting that rebound piece of the problem is critical between 1,000 and 1,500 miles because it eliminates the adaption part of the process. And in, in regards to the last piece of your two-for-one question, if you have a problem going into the corner, that problem is generally the front end. If you have a problem in the middle of the corner, that's chassis balance being off. And if you have a problem coming out of the corner, that's the back of the bike. Those are the general rules of thumb to follow to make this process a lot more simple and user friendly. But as with anything else, write down what you did. If you don't have a pen and paper and you have your phone with you, write notes on your phone of what you did. You also have the option to record your own audio. You also have the option to record video. Lots of ways in which you can track what you did. And the bottom line there for all of us is, did you smile more? Keep going. Go the same way. Don't stop because the next setting may be even better. And then when you come to something where you go, I don't know about that, you just found the range for you with your bike, the way you ride on the roads you ride, the speed you ride at, and the age of the oil and the suspension where you can relax. That is wonderful. <laughs> So, stay in that zone. The only problem we run into, especially um, with home, the temperatures between winter and summer <clears throat> are dramatically different. So you'll need seasonal settings simply because the temperature of the oil will get nowhere near as hot as it would in the summer. So have a winter setting if you commute and ride all the time and have a summer setting or basically summer settings for when you ride the bike in fair weather. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, takeaway there for a lot of people will be just how often um, they really should be changing oils uh, in the front end and given can't do that nearly so easily with most rear shocks uh, not being dismantleable. Um, how often they should be tweaking those settings just to keep yeah. them um, at the optimum level. Um, nothing there sounds too challenging, although it does require a little bit of sensitivity to what the motorcycle is doing. But anybody with a bit of experience really should be able to feel whether the bike's, um, you know, sort of performing reasonably well in the corner but what can you do if you're riding a bike um, like my xj6 diversion for example which has uh, what is um, politely referred to usually as but can be tweaked or twisted or fiddled with so at that point <clears throat> we can look at oil viscosity we can look at oil volume back in the day you could pump your front forks up to six eight ten psi and the part of but using the air pump there to get that inflation level up was to stop bottoming out because the oil was so thin it had just mow through the stroke so what we do now is choose oil viscosity so that the speed of compression is based on oil thickness so you can do that um, you can change the springs internally if you're not using too much travel and the cable tie shows that to be truthful, you can go with a softer spring. If you're bottomed out, you can go with a stiffer spring. And there are a multitude of different softer and harder, what we call rates, which is allocated number of strength. For example, zero would be the softest and going up in number is levels of firmness. So you could change the springs out <clears throat> So then we've got springs, we've got viscosity, we've got amount of oil for air spring. And then also beyond that, we can make all of that work as a system. So for the forks with budget suspension, that's fine. Now in a rear shock, there's nothing stopping you changing the spring if the spring is too strong or if it is too soft. <clears throat> and pulling the shock out and changing the spring over is nowhere near as easy as non-adjustable forks. So there's sp some specialty tools required there, a little more expertise about pulling a shock out. Um, nowhere near as easy as pulling out a set of forks. So <clears throat> at that point, we are blessed with the web. We are 
tremendously blessed in the UK with the amount of suspension knowledge and manufacturers. So getting information on the spring rates you need for the front and rear can make all the difference in the world. And the other piece of the puzzle there that's critical is you need to buy the right springs based on the application. If you're commuting, then it needs to provide you with a compliant ride so you're not getting to work. And after a year, you need a new set of teeth or a mouth guard. <clears throat> Similarly, you shouldn't have shrunk three millimeters over the course of the year commuting because the bike is beating you up. So you can find the right springs. But if you take a passenger, then you need the spring to be at its minimum level of adjustability on the rear shock because generally most are just right for you so that if you put the passenger on or if you put the passenger and luggage on the spring can cope with that additional weight so choosing a spring should and when i had a shop it was a 15 minute discussion it was not i want this it was more of a conversation about how do you use your motorcycle how often do you use it what types of use do you go through? What parameters are you going to use it in? If you spend most of the time on the motorway, then there's a certain spring that will be much more applicable. Then you spend hours and hours doing B roads. So there needs to be some reflection or conversation in, in regards to choosing the springs with budget suspension so that you can get it right. And as we mentioned earlier, some of those budget shocks that are not serviceable can be made serviceable. So again, that's all part of the same question. The other part that's really good is because there are many bored people over the last few decades, they have taken surrogate shocks off other motorcycles, which are fully serviceable and transplanted them into their budget bike. So a lot of forums have excellent technical information on fork swap if you wanted fully adjustable forks, for example, um, and shock swaps, which ones fit easily, which ones are more difficult, which ones are shorter, which ones are longer. And the rule of thumb is if you are going to change that rear shock out, it has to be at least the same length, if not five millimeters longer, um, because most budget bikes – have shorter shocks in, which isn't very beneficial to handling in the grand scheme of things. So if you're going to do the much cheaper option, which is a surrogate transplant, just make sure it is the same or longer than stock. Okay, good. Um, yeah, a couple of interesting points there. The, the first one is that people tend to forget that there is air in the forks and that the air itself is a spring. So if you put more oil in, you reduce the volume of air and you compress it harder, which basically firms up the spring. So that's a very easy thing that uh, anybody yeah. can do with basic oil forks. And funny enough, the spring transplant is something I did. Um, I used to have an old GS500. You may remember those. have one of those yeah. when they first came out. And the first thing I realized was that the back end of the bike was far too soft. Um, so I, I found a, a, a semi-adjustable shock, shall I say, off of a bigger Suzuki put it on it's had a hard spring a little bit of uh, compression um damping i think it was and uh, it, it transformed the handling of the machine actually that and some uh, different fork springs up the front as well so nothing there was anything that couldn't be attempted with a uh, a modest toolkit um yeah. then i would say is I, I wouldn't get involved in removing the spring as you said from a rear shock but under quite a lot of tension you start pulling those apart and you'll uh, <coughs> punching its way up your nostrils or something so i definitely yes. for someone who has the technical tools to deal with that um yeah. that in a way that actually kind of answers the uh, or at least addresses the next question i was going to ask you what do you think um is the best uh, bang for buck modification that you can do if you're not flush with cash can you get decent budget suspension and still get most of the benefits that you get from the high-end units Great question. Um, so let's just approach it from a budget point of view. <clears throat> the first thing is oil, which is cheap. So you would always start there, especially I like to change on damping rods and 
budget suspension, I prefer to change the fork oil every six to 8,000 miles. If it's a true damping rod suspension, you may, because there's no adjustment, you may end up changing that as quick as 4,000 or 5,000 miles because you get this bounce back, which cups and feathers the front tire dramatically. Um, so the first thing is oil. Do you service it frequently enough? Because the right oil may be the fix you need. And at, I know it's $27 in the US for fork oil. If you're changing that regularly, you're maximizing longevity and grip. That might be all you need. Now, if you're obviously using and blowing through the travel like you were with the GS500, you need an upgrade. So that upgrade at the next tier is springs. What do you need and why? And that's where that 15 minute conversation has to evolve about the spring you choose because you cannot choose the wrong one. So that's the next piece in the emptying the wallet scenario before we go grab plastic <laughs> for the bigger ticket items. Um, there are, if you're going to move up to the next tier, um, Nitron and KTEC in the UK are both very famous extremely reputable companies. So the next thing to look at if you have fully adjustable suspension is compression needles. Sometimes on stock bikes, those, those don't do anything. And at 50 US dollars for a set, you can dramatically change the way the fork works and the amount of control that you have by the engineered pieces that you install. So we're still at the budget level here, pretty cheap, but compression adjusters for the forks can make an enormous difference for a very low cost. <clears throat> Similarly, if you really don't have the time to play with <clears throat> oil, oil heights, you don't like getting dirty, there is absolutely nothing wrong with drilling and tapping the fork caps if they're blank to install air pressure valves so that you go back to what we did 40 years ago and use air pressure in the forks. So there's another modification there. We'll stay with the forks for now. Uh, the next tier up would to be replacement components. So at the bottom level of that would be components which are in essence pistons. And those pistons have a series of thin flexible steel washers. So as the oil comes through, it hits the wash. Now, depending on the thickness and the size of the triangle or what we call that oil will deflect until it reaches a certain pressure where the shims fold and the oil comes through quicker. So you can buy a kit that is a replacement piston for your OEM that comes as a complete unit. Generally, most people buy compression pistons because the rebound side of the equation is actually not that far off. And so it's, we need that support when we're breaking. So the next tier investment with the forks would be just compression pistons. And to all intents and purposes, to be honest, with people that have road bikes, that's where I stop. I don't want them buying sophisticated cartridges. To me, that is a track application use when you have the skill level to warrant that level of performance because you're putting something on a motorcycle that is built for duress and road riding generally isn't duress so for the forks that will be the way i go about it in those tiers for the rear shock <clears throat> a little more engineering required so i would study with the shock on its softest setting, what the sag number was to its highest setting, sometimes you can make a spacer to go under the spring. And the cost of a spacer under the spring and everything reinstalled fixes the problem. That spacer can be five millimeters to 10 millimeters depending on the spring you have. So there's the first cheap fix there. Obviously the second fix is going ahead and getting the correct spring. And then the third fix is buying a surrogate shock off a used bike and installing that. So, for example, my 1200 Bandit, 1250 Bandit, sorry, 
A 2008 GSXR 1000 shock fits that perfectly. Fully serviceable, fully adjustable. The spring rate's actually very close. And it cost me $47. So being cheap, but getting the correct value for the piece that you're purchasing, all of that I found out on the forums. So for $50, I got rid of a non-serviceable shark with 45,000 miles on it that was completely knackered and put a new fully adjustable shock on it. The service for the oil was $150. So now my shock is fresh and good for 8,000 to 10,000 miles for the price of 150 plus 40, so 200 bucks. And my bike performs just like your GS500 did dramatically better and then the same applies for the shock unless you're going to go to the track i don't see any point in spending two thousand dollars on a shock and two thousand dollars on a replacement fork kit to get rid of your internals the only exception i would say there is for your budget bike like your sv650s ninja 300s andriani for example makes a great bolting kit that's extremely financially very low cost so for a damping rod fork a kit like that for somebody that rides in a spirited manner and we'll leave it at that <coughs> we'll get an excellent return on the investment because at that point the front end becomes much more controllable so depending where you are depending where your budget is but most, most importantly, how long you're going to own the motorcycle. Right. Figure out what you want to spend. Okay, um, we've probably both come across the kind of rider who's thrown not just the contents of the checkbook, but the credit card as well at the bike. I think he, you know, what you said here is that for the road rider, that's absolutely not the way to go um that we can actually uh, get ourselves a decent setup for relatively little cash um just to sort of finish off um what's the worst setup you've ever experienced on a motorcycle that you've had to put right um it was impossible to put it right <laughs> in this particular instance because the fork oil was uh, forty-eight thousand miles old and the rear shock had the same mileage on it um, and also had was so worn um, it was sucking air into the shock while leaking a tiny bit of oil out so that was um, a key out of the ignition and a sit down conversation um, over a cup of coffee that i paid for for them to go ride home and never ride the bike again until it was fixed um, and I'm not afraid to do that because I know the consequences of how far that person's adapting and in a given situation, they have no chance of saving it. The ones that are fixable are the rebound ones where the bike is doing this and completely out of control. But the hard part there is usually that's very old oil. And given the fact that it's old oil, the viscosity difference cold to hot and that compromise setting for rebound tends to make the bike rough for the first 40 or 50 miles until the bike heats up but at that point that's a natural consequence of what you got and when riders understand that that is the consequence and when they get to where they're riding it rides wonderfully then it's just a case of well easy with the chip shop and the curries and the pints and put some money away so you can go ahead and service this and actually the bike will ride consecutively better all the time so the ones i find that really cause the most confusion is this rebound and balance the rebound to get this and that it needs to be revisited because tires will tell you everything where on a tire will show you if rebound is too fast and if everybody goes and looks at their own tire, they'll see on the tread pattern as the wheel rotates this way, that first edge of the tread pattern is way lower than the back edge, which stands up much, much taller. And in really bad cases, you're riding around on a three millimeter step per sipe or tread pattern on the tire. So the handling of the bike is 
because you're riding on those edges. So that'll tell you as well um, in terms of looking at the tire as confirmation. I think I'm feeling this, but the tire will always back up that viewpoint um, when you know how to read a tire um, because tires can't lie. So they're a wonderful resource of information if you look for the basic patterns. I shall go out and look at my tires right away. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, I think uh, we probably uh, need to round off the things now. I think everybody's got some really fantastic information here, which uh, hopefully will make them think a little bit more about how the bike underneath them is operating and, and, and just give people a bit of confidence to realise that the suspension is tunable. Even on a basic motorcycle, there are things that can be done to improve the way the bike handles. And as we were saying last time out about posture, um, riding a bike does take work. It isn't, and there is an element of effort involved in riding a motorcycle, full stop. But you can make it a damn sight harder for yourself if the bike isn't working in sympathy with you as you ride right. it. And the suspension, of course, is a, a vital component of that. You know, the, the, the thing I kind of always chuckle about is when somebody goes out and buys the latest tyres to hit the street corner and has never, ever given a, a moment's thought to the, what's holding those tyres onto the road because without the suspension doing its part of the bargain, um, yeah. you know, no, no tyre is any better than the next one down the chain. So people kind of get hung up on tyres uh, as, as a sort of a, for sorting their grip out. And I think they tend to ignore the suspension or they go the opposite way, as I said, and they, they throw the checkbook at it and um, I hope yeah. that will make it right. But even the expensive stuff needs setting up, doesn't it? It does. And the other thing about tyre pressure is 36.42 has been the same for 30 years. The tyre pressure on the sticker on the bike is for the tires the bike came with. If you change those out, why are you using the sticker pressure that is inappropriate for the new brand or model of tires that you've put on? Um, and we run into all kinds of issues because tires are 25% of the suspension itself. You need to find the right pressure for you. And if you ride by yourself, is there any reason why you absolutely categorically must have a higher pressure in the rear? We're conditioned to believe that that is the case. So if you're changing press, if you're changing tires, please take a look at what the manufacturer of that tire recommends, not what the sticker on the bike says. Because a 2000 Honda with 2020 tires, the pressure on that sticker is a million miles incorrect. So would you be willing to test different pressures to find the pressure that you work as a solo rider? And would you be willing to find pressures that are significantly higher front and rear if you tour or you carry luggage or you carry a passenger? So tire pressure testing is critical to the road you ride on. While the suspension can do its job well, if you can optimize pressure, then you will get the best grip. And after all, when we're leaning, we're all about grip. If we're commuting, we're all about not changing tires out, so we buy very hard tires. So as far as that goes, the other piece of the puzzle that everybody can do at home that requires no tools is put your fingers between the front and rear mudguard. How much can you get in? Now, when you put your new tires on, do the same thing because that'll tell you if your bike went that way, this way, that way, or this way. So when you go test ride it, the idiom of I have new tires, therefore I am a god, and will rock it through my corners is completely wrong because the circumference of the tires are all different. And if you line up a whole row of 180 55s, it's a mountain range because they don't have a universal mold agreed between all manufacturers. So understanding changing tires and getting your hands dirty before and after will help you understand why the handling of the bike has changed dramatically. You cannot buy bad tires today. I've even used Shinkos on the track and done two seconds off my personal best. 
So we carry a lot of history based on what used to be there. Younger generations don't have that history. There's no bad tires. There's just bad information. And so at that point, please assess when you change the tires, how the geometry of your motorcycle changed and what pressures you need for your environment with those tires. Because one of the things we don't consider is the, the way the tires engineered. All we read about is this is the best tire. It's got the best grip. This is awesome. And so peer pressure or reading information tends to lean us towards a purchase. But could you do that one step more of due diligence and actually understand how it's going to affect your motorcycle and what pressures you need? Because at that point, you'll get 100% out of the tires versus maybe 30%. Right. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Yes, certainly um, tires are often forgotten when it comes to suspension setup. Um, Right. So, okay. I think we've reached the uh, logical point to call it. Uh, a day here. I think again, a bit sure. of useful information here. Um, same question as I asked you last time out, just for those who missed last week's show. Um, what resources do you have available that will help people with their suspension setup? So there's everything is under Dave Moss Tuning. Um, Facebook, I put posts up every week. I post a Friday question. You can contribute, you can read and learn what other people contribute. Dave Moss on YouTube is a channel with almost a thousand videos up there that you can sit and study if you prefer visual learning. And then Dave Moss Tuning website has videos, podcasts, and articles for you to go reference. Um, YouTube and the website have search functions. So you can type in forks, shocks, suspension, tires, chains, chains, chain tension, servicing, to guide you to the right content because it'll take forever to go through all of that stuff. So please be diligent and use the search function. Um, So there's a ton of material online over the last 20 plus years of putting that out there for people um, in sharing what I learned. So for example, the new Tracer GT, everything I've learned about that bike is in a series of articles on the website because that's becoming an incredibly popular motorcycle because it is an outrageous bargain <clears throat> for what you get. Um, so please leverage the content. And when you understand what you are going to go do and you learn from that, would you please pay it forward and help somebody else? As my mission is to save a life every day through understanding and education. So the more people we can help, uh, the less people get hurt the more people enjoy their motorcycle. And if a crisis does occur, their motorcycle will perform admirably in that crisis versus disappointingly because they're riding settings that don't belong to them. Right. Well, okay. We'll leave it there then, Dave. Thank you very much indeed again for your time. Um, I'm sure that uh, our viewers will have picked up some really useful stuff today. And let's hope they can go out there and combine it with what they learned last time out and get to improve their riding and um, their enjoyment of their machine. Thank you very much indeed again. And uh, take care uh, over there in the US. Will do, sir. Right, okay, we got to the end of that. Uh, 50 odd minutes there of very, very useful stuff from Dave Moss. Um, I dare say that uh, you will have to go back and review that on a number of occasions and probably cross reference it over to his website as well and uh, to see what he's got to say on specific issues over there. But I think the important thing is that what, he, what Dave is saying here is that we don't have to spend lots of money to get a road bike handling well. Um, it's always something of a concern of mine that when I see sort of bike tuning articles um, with, with suspension focused on uh, in, in the bike press, very often they use a test track to uh, actually sort out the suspension. So they're not setting the bike up for the road at all. They're setting the bike up for flat out performance on the track. And if you've ever ridden on a track and then ridden on the road on the way home, you'll know that the two are completely different. Uh, You know, you need a bike that handles very, very differently on the road. It's why they have to set up TT bikes very differently from uh, the track machine. And of course, TT riders are pushing much, much harder than we ever do on the road. So 
uh, have a look at the, uh, the the rerun of this, which I'm going to put up on um, YouTube fairly shortly when I get a moment. And don't forget, if, if you've actually enjoyed the show, uh, you can support me over on my coffee page. Um, and there is subscriber and supporter content going up all the time over there. So, right. OK, so our next show will be Wednesday. Um, I, I'm going to be thinking, uh, as possibly people are going back to work and the viewing numbers are dropping off, about uh, maybe rowing back a little bit on the number of shows I'm doing. Um, but I'll update you on that as and when. Uh, right now, the next show is still scheduled for Wednesday. So, again, thank you very much for turning out and uh, hopefully see you all again on Wednesday. Bye for now from Kevin Williams here of Survival Skills and uh, bye from Elevenses.